Welcome, welcome to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. We have a very special show today. The subject is author Stella Pope Duarte, Raul Isaguirre, seated at the table of power number one. And I'm sure you noticed that I said number one because we are planning on having several shows on this subject. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing subject. It's uh, a book, a book written by author Stella Pope Duarte. Uh, the title is Raul Isaguirre, Seated at the Table of Power. And we are going to be having several shows. Before we get into the nitty-gritty, as they say, of this uh, important subject, I would like to remind you that we do Facebook Live. So if you do Facebook, you're driving, you're at home, whatever you are, when you have time, Please uh, find us, like us, or follow us, and then recommend our page. Share it with others. We are addressing very, very important issues. Uh, I have certain three objectives that I would like to accomplish uh, through this platform, and that is to educate on relevant issues, celebrate Latino accomplishments, and connect the community. And I believe we are doing that. So thank you so very much for joining today. We um, have lunch. We have lunch Facebook as well, and it looks like everything's uh, going well. Uh, I would like to now introduce uh, to you uh, my special guest, author Stella Pope Duarte. Stella, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure knowing you and having uh, you in, on our show today. Thank you for inviting me. I, I feel honored to be here. Thank you. You know, uh, we started our conversation about doing the uh, shows for this book that you wrote. If I remember right, it's, it has 28 chapters. Yes. It has something like 417 pages. 17 pages. Mm -hmm. It's a thick book. It's about Raul Hector is his yes. middle name. Humberto. Uh, perdón, Humberto. Mm -hmm. yeah. Raúl e Raúl Humberto, Humberto is, uh, Isaguirre. Isaguirre. An amazing man. Uh, he's still with us. Yes, he is. And uh, so we're going to talk about his life, uh, his his contributions to the community, and, and many, many things that it's going to be an amazing, amazing show. Uh, we will not have a consecutive, we will not have you consecutively on shows consecutive shows but we will you know introduce other topics and then we'll bring you back okay sounds fine we'll to do me that hopefully it'll be three to five shows or between now and the end of the year we should cover that book <laughs> yes it's an enormous task to tell the story of such a leader right and a leader who served his community with everything he was and right. everything he had yeah yeah so we're going to talk about again uh, raul isaguirre but before we do I would like to ask you, uh, Stella, for those that might not know you, that those that are listening and or joining by Facebook, who is Stella Pop Duarte? Um, can you tell us? Uh, I I, I want to say a little bit, but there's so much to, even about you that just take a few minutes if you can let us know a little bit about yourself. Well, that will put me right back into La Sonorita Barrio which is off of 7th Avenue and Buckeye Road. Mm -hmm. And that's where I was born and raised. As a matter of fact, I was born right there in the house that is off of 7th Avenue and Pima. In the house? In the house, wow. because my parents were, were poor. I mean, we didn't mm -hmm. have a lot. And in those days, the doctor would go mm. to a home okay. and deliver a baby. Mm. So that's where I was born. Although my youngest uh, sister, the last of the family, I was second to the last. She was born at uh, Memorial Hospital mm -hmm. because my mom had uh, some problems with that pregnancy. But I was born right there and to, uh, with a doctor who was Dr. Solomon, mm -hmm. <laughs> our family doctor. Mm -hmm. He was a black mm -hmm. man, and he suffered a lot of discrimination himself. Mm -hmm. And he was our family doctor, okay. and that's where I was born. And so my upbringing has a lot to do with family, mm -hmm. exactly the way Raul Isaguirre's family also was. Got it. Very connected in the barrio. And barrio is not even a, a Spanish word. It's an indigenous word. Interesting. Mm -hmm. well, now, just tell us a little bit about the barrio concept. This is uh, before the airport was built. There was a lot of the Mexican community, uh, would you say, 
I don't know, I don't want to use the word divided, but they, they lived in different areas and they, they were called barrios. And you mentioned, what's the barrio name again? La Sonorita. La Sonorita. Can you mention other barrio names that would existed then? Yeah, it was like uh, the uh, the other ones was Santa Rita, Santa and Rita. then Siete Avenida, mm -hmm. and then there was Golden Gate, mm -hmm. and, and several of the Cuatro Milpas mm -hmm. was another barrio. Right. So there were various barrios, but they collected their names just from what people felt they wanted to to call themselves mm -hmm. you know, the golden gate or cuatro milpas because they were in places where there used to be cornfields mm -hmm. but with mine i guess there was people there from sonora mm -hmm. that had settled into the area and so they called it la sonorita mm -hmm. and it what happens in a barrio is you live and breathe family right you know, down the street is your abuela and, mm -hmm. you know, su, su nana and tata and tios and everybody. So it is a real village. Right. And we, uh, across the street were uh, African-Americans. Mm. So we were mixed in with mm -hmm. uh, African-Americans who were wonderful neighbors mm -hmm. and the Chinese markets right. okay. so it's real multicultural <laughs> I, I learned <laughs> my multicultural, multicultural right uh, as a child mm. now uh, take us through your your uh, you know school experience since we're talking about you and and that way we we know uh just uh, were you the first to go to university yes that that's correct in the family others had uh, gone to high school mm -hmm. my sisters had left high school to go to work and one of them later went and got her degree as well but i was the first to graduate from arizona state university i went first to phoenix college and and that was a big deal for us to have that level of education mm -hmm. in the family i right. got to a master's and several other endorsements so i wanted so to so first you you went to phoenix college then you transferred to asu yes and you got a bs i got my um degree in education, education and a master's in counseling okay a master's in counseling mm -hmm. good good um i i think i what, what what i would like to do i think we still have three minutes before we go on our first break can you uh, tell us how you talk about my own miraculous journey as an author from the barrios of south phoenix mm -hmm. so there, there seems to be a story behind how you become a writer can you uh, tell it, tell us that story? Well, first of all, I was a, a little girl that that loved to read. Mm -hmm. So I'd go to Harmon Park. There's now a, a, a whole mural or mosaic of me mm -hmm. at Harmon Park mm -hmm. Library mm -hmm. because I read all the children's books that mm -hmm. were available. So a child begins to be who they are early on. Mm -hmm. So my whole thing was words mm -hmm. and poems and collect. I had a little book where I collected words. Mm -hmm. Other kids collected marbles and stuff, and I was where they're collecting little words. And then I'd come and do plays and so forth. So so what happened with myself is the reading opened a mm -hmm. lot for me. Mm -hmm. The ability to see stories that were inside my head mm -hmm. in words. Mm -hmm. That helped me a lot. So the, the, the appetite for reading, was that something that just was just born in you or the, the, your parents encouraged, uh, encouraged it? I believe it was both, both. because uh, there were stories always being told mm -hmm. at the kitchen table. They, we are great storytellers. We're, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, mixed in with the indigenous. Right. And then I have my Irish side of the family, which mm -hmm. are very flamboyant. Mm -hmm. And uh, my tata was uh, Solomon Pope, and he was a huge storyteller. Mm -hmm. So there was no end to stories going on in the family. And, and that helped me and encouraged me, because stories come from who you are. Right. And they certainly came to us from all members of the family. So you get Pope from your mm, dad's side of the family or mom? My mom. Your mom's side of the family. Yes. She was Irish? Yes, she was Rosanna Pope. Was she born in the U.S. or in, our, in, in Ireland? In, uh, here, she was born in the U.S. Was she first generation? She was, I believe, second generation. Second generation. Because her, her, okay. her father mm -hmm. was first generation here. Okay, okay. So she was second generation. Mm -hmm. And they came from uh, from Ireland, but they came by way of Mexico as well. Mm -hmm. As you know, the Irish have a, uh, quite a bit of uh, people that have migrated right. into uh, in, into Mexico from mm -hmm. Ireland. Right. And they fought along with the Mexicanos during the, the wars right. way back in That's Spain right. and everything. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Grandpa was uh, one of those people. So by the time you were born, uh, did that mix of uh, Mexico with Irish, was that... 
it looked more what like Mexican would you say my grandpa was blue-eyed uh -huh. but he spoke Spanish too mm -hmm. and and because uh, he loved my my grandmother and of Claudia course. Pope <laughs> she was beautiful so mm -hmm. um he learned to like I tell some people he learned to speak Spanish overnight you know mm -hmm. and um and so we were uh, basically Spanish speakers, okay. including and my grandmother. And the food and the mm -hmm. lifestyle, was it a kind of a mix or more Mexican? Would it you was say? more Mexican. I did not realize that corned beef and cabbage was uh, Irish uh -huh. until I was researching one of my books in Washington, D.C., mm. and we went to a <laughs> pub. Right. And the first thing on the menu was corned beef and cabbage. And I said, wait a minute, mom used to make that every week. Is that Irish? Mm. <laughs> Sometimes you don't even know who you right, are right, until right. You, you see it in front of you on a menu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to take a short break. Stay with us. You are listening to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. The subject today, author Stella Pope Duarte, and the title is Raul Isaguirre, uh, Seated at the Table of Power Number One. We'll be right back. Thank you for staying with us. This is AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. The subject today, author Stella Pope Duarte, Raul Isaguirre, seated at the table of power number one. So let's continue, Stella. There's so much to cover. Uh, we, I still want to uh, kind of lead into how this book, uh, you know, who proposed you, uh, you know, you to write this book, to you to write this book, etc. But uh, you, uh, off the air, you were telling me about a dream of your mom. Can you relate that to us? Yes, my mother was a person who gave me a great gift, mm. which was the ability to look internally mm. into my own soul. Mm -hmm. Even as a child, she would sit with me and tell me a dream. Mm. And she would say, well, I had this dream. I dreamed of traveling or whatever it was and then she would ask me and what do you think that means hmm. well I was just a little girl I had no idea but with my mother I learned how to pay attention hmm. to the metaphors because okay. I tell people you can speak all the languages that you want to but you need to understand the language of your own soul hmm. so my mother taught me that and that I keep as a great gift so when she was uh, in a marriage that that forced her to go to Mexico. This man that she met, he was a very handsome military man. Mm. My mother was an extremely beautiful woman. Mm. So he takes her to Mexico, although my mom was born in Phoenix, mm -hmm. and my mom wanted to come back home. Mm. And over there she had two little girls in Obregón, and he wouldn't let her. Mm. And my mother said she had a dream in which she saw herself coming back to uh, Phoenix on the train going to Nogales, mm. and with her were her two little girls, two suitcases, and sitting next to her was Christ. Hmm. And she said, and this is how I knew him, by his profile. Hmm. So throughout my life, I heard that one dream of hers, and that's exactly what happened. Hmm. He only allowed her two suitcases because he was afraid she wouldn't come back, <laughs> okay. and she didn't. Mm -hmm. And that's how she came back and married my dad, who she had known since childhood. And that's what, the, so you, you were born after the, your first two sisters? Yes. Okay. I was born, I was born as part of the Duarte family. Right. So Duarte uh, got it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let us, uh, tell us a little bit, and, and we're, we're landing, we're going to land in, in how the book, uh, Raul Isaguirre, Seated at the uh, Table of Power, you know, comes about. But uh, can you, t you've written several other books. 
And you know what? As I was hearing, uh, listening to you speak, uh, I mean, I can tell that that's um, a signature of yours, that internal, the spirituality that probably will set you up uh, aside from other writers. I mean, because writing, I suppose it has a lot of, you know, research in the mind, but there's there's an element to your writings that it, that, that, that conveys a deeper sense uh, of, of humanity and spirituality is, is my assessment would you say is accurate yes and, and you got that from 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 yes. mom and i also explain to people i've also explored my own internal being to figure mm. out what am i doing here mm -hmm. and i tell people unless you understand the purpose of your own life mm -hmm. you have discovered nothing mm. because you don't even know who you are right you're like this atlantis right you know like this hidden hidden something inside of you and you have to identify it and say this is who i am so for a long time i didn't know who i was as far as a writer i was an educator right i got my degrees i was teaching and i was doing a counseling at huge high schools head of counseling for cesar chavez and carl hayden and so forth so i was doing what i had gotten my education for if you had said to me, Stella, you're going to publish and your work is going to be all over the world, mm. I think I would have broken a rib laughing because mm. I had no concept right. until in my 40s I had a dream. Mm. And again, my mother's, uh, uh, you know, teaching me dreams. And I had a dream of my father. And in the dream, my father showed up and I was lost and looking for a way out mm. of this building. Right. And in the dream, I see my dad wearing his work clothes, mm -hmm. you know, because he was a carpenter, and he had his, uh, his khaki pants and so forth. He takes my hand, and he leads me to a spiral staircase mm -hmm. that went up into the heavens. Mm. And on my book, uh, Writing Through Revelations, Visions, and Dreams, there is the spiral staircase. Mm. Not exactly the way I saw it, but you know, a rendition of right. it. And my dad is telling me there, in front of that spiral staircase, holding my hand. It's right there, Mija. Right, right. Mm. It's right in front of you, what mm. you have to do next. Mm. I had no idea it mm. was the writing. Wow. Not at all. Mm. Until two weeks later, when I put two and two together, and I was doing a lot of research for one of my classes. I was late at night, my children were asleep, 1.30 in the morning, all by myself in a utility room, and I mm. start writing the words of the dream on the wow. computer. Wow, And in 1995, and when I get to the words where it's right there, which, and, I, and I said out loud to nobody because the kids were all asleep, mm -hmm. I said, do you mean I'm a writer? Mm. And it was like every cell in my body cried out, mm. that's what you were born to do. Wow, wow, and, amazing. And later on, we, we'll, we'll uh, come to a point where Raul Isaguirre actually uh, asked you or made a statement that to me is very powerful. Actually, I'll, I'll relate it, but... He basically told you, are you still working? And, and he said, you shouldn't be working. You should be writing because he saw in you the, uh, the gift of, of, of writing. So that's how basically you become a writer. Now, uh, in, in reading, and I started to read the book. I obviously haven't finished it, the, uh, the Raul Isaguirre biography. And then just hearing you uh, about knowing who you are. Do you think that, that many, many of us uh, or, or that knowing who we are uh, galvanizes into action, would you say? In other words, not knowing, we tend to not feel like we need to do anything. But once we know a little bit of our history, just like in, in Raul, right? Uh, the more he knew about the history, the more it seems like something within him was rising up to do something about it kind of thing. Yes, and the, know we, the more we know our own story, too, mm -hmm. we take on a task, and one of the tasks on earth is to complete who you are. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people sometimes don't mm -hmm. because they don't recognize inside of them, what are my talents, what are some of the things? And also this whole idea of just taking a risk. Mm -hmm. It was a big risk for me right. to do the things I was doing because mm -hmm. I'm sole support of my family at the right. time. You know, I have four children. Now they're grown and so mm -hmm. forth. But I tell you, when you are presented something from within, then you have a choice. Right. right. The choice is yours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can either decide to sit on the steps of the spiral staircase mm -hmm. and never move up. You know, you can decide to go backwards or you can decide to go nowhere. Mm. I did not know that. Right. Right. So my choice 
without knowing was that I was to write. Mm. And that's what started my first book contract for Fragile Night, mm. which is stories right from the barrio. My first story is from my spiritual mentor, La Llorona. Mm -hmm. What La Llorona he, knew was my first story. He, tell us a little bit about the books that you've written. We have about five more minutes for this segment. If you can take those five minutes or whatever you need to kind of tell us the books that you've written so far and then what they are about. Well, the first one is Fragile Night. It's short stories directly from uh, my experiences in the body. In other words, places of loneliness, places where we have touched the heart, and everybody in there is having an hijuela moment. Mm. You know, hijuela. hijuela. Yeah, aha, <laughs> you know. Oh, is that why I married him? Oh, my God, I thought I loved him. You, mm. you know, so everybody's having an hijuela moment. Mm -hmm. And and my ex-husband's in there. You know, this is where you get back mm. to people, but not in, in a bad way. You right, get right. back to them with story. Mm. And you start just writing about where you come from. Mm. I did not realize mm. that. Right. I was looking all over the place when the treasure was already inside of me mm. where i had been raised so that was the first book and it got a claim it went for the uh, finalist for the pen west fiction award mm -hmm. my first book wow and they uh, this author writes to me and says you're one of the writers who will enlarge humanity i'm like excuse me wow i had no <laughs> Your first book. idea mm. i didn't even know what the pen west fiction mm. was and mm. then shortly after that i became interested in our veterans mm because I was part of the right. Vietnam era. I was in high school and so forth when that war was raging. Mm -hmm. And I became very concerned about that because I had memories mm -hmm. of our guys, right, right. our Latino kids being taken and put on the front lines. Mm -hmm. And many of the brown and black youngsters, and including the indigenous, were put on the front lines. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I thought, what happened there? Because I remember the funerals. Right. And I had some of my friends from high school on the, you know, on the Vietnam Memorial Wall, their names. Mm, right. So I made a pledge, and I always make a pledge for every mm, book, mm -hmm. to tell their story mm. to the world. Wow. So in order to do that, I went through twice across the country to the wall, Vietnam mm. Wall, six times. Wow. To Vietnam, to Saigon, to interview everyone I could get my hands on mm. who had anything to do with the war. And I pledged that I would dedicate the book to the first soldier whose family I interviewed mm. who had died in Vietnam, and mm. that was Tony Cruz. Tony not Cruz. knowing that Tony Cruz, see, I didn't know Tony Cruz, mm. not knowing that he had told his family that someday he was going to be famous, mm. that he was going to be in a book. Amazing. I Amazing. had no idea. Amazing. La Llorona, what do you talk about in that book? It, my first story, and I say that she's my spiritual mentor. I know she's a ghost, mm. but she's the official ghost of Mexico and many other countries <laughs> as well. And she scared the bejeebies out of us. Of course. And she was always <laughs> looking for chi her children. And mm -hmm. of course, my uh, you know storytellers, my parents or whoever was telling the story would say, and you look like one of her kids. Mm. So don't be out late at night. Right. And right. after we were teenagers, we found out, well, she's not really going to catch us. You know, right, right. Of, but she has a message to tell mm, us. Mm. And so in my first story I ever wrote, What La Llorona Knew, people will find the message mm. at the end of the story. Mm. She has a very important message to tell the modern world. And mm. I'm not going to say what it is. You I want to let people. Oh, man, now <laughs> I'm going to have to go read it. Fragile night, you're going to have to get the book. Uh, we still have a couple minutes or a minute and a half. What other books? Uh, well, after, after Let Their Spirits Dance and all the, the wonders I had with that book and honoring our veterans, mm -hmm, it's very important mm -hmm. to honor our veterans, right. was uh, If I Die in Juarez, mm. another pledge. Mm. I gave up my work as a counselor and educator at uh, Phoenix Union High School District. I still teach part-time college mm -hmm. and university. I've taught university for many, many years, mm. and I do that part-time. But I gave everything up to go to Ciudad Juarez mm. for three years in and out of Ciudad Juarez to tell the story of the women of Juarez. Mm. And I don't regret a single moment wow. to honor those beloved women. Mm. Amazing, amazing. Obviously, you've written other articles. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I went in on your website, and, and, and by the way, uh, you have a website. It's, it's StellaPopeDuarte.com. Yes. Oh. If you are listening to our, this show, Whenever you do, please go and visit that website. It is amazing. There's a lot there about uh, our guest today. Please visit that page. It's Stella, n not Estela, but Stella. Mm -hmm. StellaPopeDuarte.com. That's the page. Visit it, StellaPopeDuarte.com. And you'll see some pictures. You have pictures of your mother there. Yes. And, and I agree. She was she <laughs> was beautiful, beautiful uh, woman. 
Uh, stay with us. We are going to take another short break, and we'll be right back. This is uh, AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. The subject today is author Stella Pop Duarte, Raúl Izaguirre, seated at the table of power number one. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. The subject today is author Stella Pop Duarte, Raul Izaguirre, seated at the table of power. What, is, what a subject. I'm going to have to ask you about that too. And remember, this is number one. We are planning on having more than one show. They, it will not be consecutive, but we will be bringing our uh, guests today for several shows, I believe. Um, I want to remind you that please, 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 if you do Facebook, Um, find us, follow us, and share our page. It is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. If you do not have Facebook, uh, we also have a YouTube channel uh, by the same name. And for YouTube, you do not have to have a channel or an account. So you can watch the, the video also there author, uh, at AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Uh, for Facebook, you do have to have an account to watch videos or, or see posts. Uh, before we go to, to talk a little bit about how uh, the project, because this was a, an under, a huge undertaking to write such a, such a book, um, Stella, uh, I think you still ha wanted to mention some other writings that you've done. Go ahead. Yes. One of the writings that I also did was on Van Buren Street, and many of your uh, audience, I'm sure, mm. knows what I'm talking about. Mm. It was one of the original streets connecting us to California Texas, Nuevo Mexico, and, and all over really? the place. Before the freeways. I, that I did not know. Yes, before the freeways were built, wow. way, way back. And so it's a very popular street. It had all the hotels and motels. Mm. And, and it was, I call it the uh, Arizona Sunset Strip mm. because it had all the neon lights. And right. as a little kid, I used to see all these fancy uh, lights all over the hotels and everything. So I wrote a book called Women Who Live in Coffee Shops mm. because I recall one of the coffee shops, it was Hell Scenes. And it was right on the corner, 7th Avenue and uh, Van Buren, right right there, right mm -hmm. on uh, Van Buren. Right. And we used to go there, mm. you know, to, to have uh, breakfast and so forth. So I wrote a collection of stories that won the um, Latino Literary Award mm. from the University of California in Irvine. Amazing. So it won a huge award, and the, uh, it was highly acclaimed for, uh, for the stories. Mm. But some of them are hilarious. Mm. I mean, some of them are, <laughs> they're going to take you back to all kinds of, of places. And then after that, of course, I wrote my memoir. Mm -hmm. So uh, any of, of you, of your listeners who are interested in dreams, in how to take care of themselves internally, should get my memoir, mm -hmm. uh, Writing Through Revelations, Visions, and Dreams. And then after that is when I met Raul Isaguirre, mm -hmm. and he was over uh, having lunch. Yeah. Before we get mm -hmm. to Raul, um, how do people get your books? Okay. Well, they can... They can go to Amazon. They can go to okay. anywhere. They, they can go to any bookseller mm -hmm. that they use mm -hmm. and, um, you know, ask for the book. 
Or they can go to the library, check out my books there. Okay. They're all over in the Your library. books are in the library and they yes, can be they're, checked they're out? they're everywhere. They're, oh, wow. they're everywhere. That I did not know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. let me uh, uh, mm -hmm. prep, prep this uh, so that we can start uh, now getting into how you started writing this book. Uh, Dr. Christine Marin mm -hmm. wrote uh, on that book, I believe, and she wrote, Stella Pope Duarte's masterpiece celebrating the life and legacy of one of America's most prominent civil rights leaders. That's what she wrote. And then um, you state, my goal in writing a comprehensive biography of Raul Humberto Izaguirre is to deliver to the nation, I love that phrase, to deliver to this nation the story of a national hero on par with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Cesar Chavez. I cannot believe you said that. You must believe it. <laughs> I believe it totally. Amazing. And I mean, I mean you're, you're basically placing Raul Izaguirre on par with Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. and Cesar Chavez. This is going to be good. Yes. L you know, learning about. So now tell us how, uh, how did you meet him and, and how was the decision to write a book on him came about? What happened was I was, like I said, moving along, doing what I had to do as a writer, mm -hmm. working. I have my children and now I have grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, very busy and I have to do presentations all over the nation mm -hmm. and so forth. So I was at El Portal for a luncheon and I had heard that Raul Isaguirre had been invited by Dr. Uh, Michael Crow, mm -hmm. president of ASU, to come and be the executive director for the Civil Rights Development Office that they mm -hmm. were opening. Okay. So he came into Phoenix with a lot of acclaim and publicity. Mm -hmm. So I had did not know him, but I had heard of him, and I had seen him here and there. So here he was sitting at the restaurant. It was very crowded, El Portal. And he had his whole entourage of people because mm. everybody wanted to follow Raul wherever wow. he went. That's there was, famous, huh? Yeah, microphones always, you know, right there for him. You know, please tell us, give us a quote. Even He's, media. E all the time. Wow. Everywhere he went. Hmm. So I was sitting there and this lady came up to me at the restaurant and she said, uh, do you know Raul Isaguirre? And I said, uh, well, I, I've heard of him. I, I know who he is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she said, well, he'd, he'd like to speak to you. Wow. I said, to me? This is amazing. <laughs> and she said, and she pointed to the table where Raul was. Mm -hmm. And so I got up to go there to Raul, and there's this whole entourage all mm. around him. Mm. And he said, you're Stella Pope Duarte. And I said, yes. And he said, well, I've heard about you. I've, I've read your books. Let their, I've read your book, Let Their Spirits Dance. I've seen interviews of you on television. He said, but now I know who you are, mm. he told me, because I read Let Their Spirits Dance. Mm. You're mm. a gifted writer. Wow. So I'm standing there in front of him, not knowing what to say. Right, right. So I didn't say anything. <laughs> wow. I was stunned. Amazing. And then he says to me, are you still working? Mm -hmm. And I said, Meaning holding a job, yes. right? It, meaning uh -huh. doing other work besides writing. Right, right. And I said, yes, because I was. I was teaching, mm -hmm. and oh, my mm -hmm. gosh, you know, my schedule was insane. And he said, no, you should not be working. Hmm. You should only be writing. The community needs you. Wow. And I was just with my mouth open mm -hmm. thinking, what? Who is this man? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did not know that he is known for that. He mm. is known for looking at someone and empowering them. Mm. He mentors and empowers. I did not know that. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Now, there was another encounter at El Comedor, El Comedor. restaurant. So yeah. how did, can you relate to us? That yes, encounter? and I know some of your people that are listening know El Comedor because right. it's very good food. Right, right. And so, so now you mentioned El Portal. Yes, El Portal. This is by Earl. Post 41, and the owners are Earl Wilcox, Co Wilcox and, and Mary Rose. And Mary Rose, of yeah, course. Mary Rose, Wilcox. And then the El Comedor. El Comedor. Mm -hmm. So we finally met there, and I'm sitting across from him, and there were some people there who knew him, you know, and said hello to him and so forth. But anyway, so I'm sitting there, and he's talking about the history of Texas. Hmm. And he said, I'd like to do 
a project on the history now, of Texas. He's telling you that or, or to the folks that were with no, him? No, he's telling me. The, he's it was telling just you me the and story, him. the history of Texas. Yeah, basically. he wanted to do Texas history because he said we have suffered so much segregation mm. and discrimination, similar to the way you have in Arizona. Right. And he said, I'd, I'd like to do a project on the history of Texas. Mm. And so mm. I'm sitting there talking to him, and I, I didn't really, I could put in, you know, some two cents about so you're, Texas. So you're, you're writer mind is it was it working or you were just kind of still kind of making well, sense of what was going on i'm trying to find out what he wanted to see me about okay. because he said i'll call you in two weeks okay when we were at el portal and i thought he probably won't call me you know because people say that all the time mm -hmm. they say oh i'll call you and i'll get back with you right and sure enough mm. two weeks passed and his secretary called me and said his assistant called me and said Raul would like to know where do you want to have lunch. Mm -hmm. So that's how we were sitting there. And I said, well, Raul, has a, a biography been done of you, mm -hmm. of your entire life? Right, right. And he said, not yet. Mm. And as soon as he said, not yet, it was like he was saying, you're going to do it. Mm. <laughs> and I thought, well, why don't I do <laughs> your biography and include the history of of Texas, of the Rio Grande Valley, because that's where he was born. And he said, yes. So basically, do you think he, he didn't, he only had in mind the history of Texas, and then when you proposed, he thought about it, or, or, or he may have already had something in mind that would include his own? Well, and that's a good question. Mm. I haven't been asked that before. Mm. And I can answer you this way. He is so humble. Mm. Mm. He is a man who almost stays in the background while others are, are shining and taking wow. the credit wow. and he's the one who's gotten them there so in fact he might have not even been thinking of himself hmm. he might have been thinking of let's understand this whole thing of what it means to live along the border right that's right. what he wanted mm. so so but, eventually uh, he did want it to include uh, i read a little bit on the book that uh, you know personal uh, to make it very very human the, uh, the ordeals the challenges and in he really wanted you to include all that right eventually definitely he told me right away he said stella just write it like a story mm. and i said you know what Raul? you've chosen the right person because <laughs> i right. love story mm. and that's exactly what i'm going right. to do right he said tell the stories of all the other people mm. Mm. that have been involved in my life right and right. then of course the dedication is to graciela Il Olivares, mm. who Oliveras, who was one of our anchor women here in Phoenix many, many years ago for radio talk shows and so forth. And mm. she was also uh, a, a, an attorney and the first woman uh, Latina to graduate from Harvard with her law degree. Wow. So she was a great asset to the Latino community in the 40s and 50s and so forth when she mm. was in Washington, D.C. Who called her Amazing Grace? He did. He did, huh? And that was one of her nicknames. Right, right. They everybody called her Amazing Grace. Mm. And you know, um, Stella, I, I, I think I've, I've seen uh, Raúl Isaguirre, and I've, I've seen his name. Actually, I, I even have him on my email distribution list. He's probably used to get my emails some in the past. And I, I, I just, I, I never could get a hold of who he is, who he was. And just by the little bit that I've been able to to learn about through your book, I mean, people that do not know Raúl Isaquire may be thinking, how can Stella be comparing Raúl to Martin Luther King Jr. and to Cesar Chavez? But I believe as we develop this subject over a few, you know, a few weeks, we will all be convinced that what a man this is, what a what a what contributions he he has done. So now, it just uh, we have just a one more minute. How much of an effort? What was the effort like? The, I, I understand it's five to six years that it took you to to just relate to us in a minute that that effort that it took you to complete this project. It was a tremendous effort because I'm writing the story of someone who is living now, mm -hmm. and he's in Maryland with his wife, Audrey, 
Her name was Aud Audrey Bristow is her, her last name. So, she, so he married an Anglo-Saxon yes, lady? Yes, he did. And okay. we'll, we can talk about that later. The hurricane oh. that happened in Texas when they found out he was going to marry an Anglo woman. Well, we, <laughs> we could. But later we on, should. we'll find out about the hurricane from his uh, grandmother, who mm -hmm. was a fireball. Wow. And, and uh, his... The grandma on grand his side? Grandmother. Uh, or on her side? On the maternal side, oh. you know, of, of uh, Isagiris. Uh, right, right, right. Grandmother was uh, a fiery woman. To say the least. Lots of issues that Lots. he would, was marrying an Anglo-Saxon person. Yes. Well, I, oh, I have funny, funny stories about, about all that. You know that. what? Let me interrupt you because we have to go on a short break and we'll continue with this uh, matter of uh, the effort that it took you to uh, write this book. Stay with us. Uh, you are listening to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection, the subject author, Stella Pop Duarte, Raul Izaguirre, seated at the table of power number one. We will be right back. You, thank you for staying with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic. What a show. I am just having so much fun doing it. And I am so thankful to uh, author Stella Pope Duarte uh, for joining us. And she has agreed to keep on, keep on coming uh, or keep coming uh, for several shows. They will not be consecutive, though. But uh, we will bring her back because we haven't even started uh, talking about the book itself. We're just kind of making our way uh, into it. You know, let me read something, uh, Stella, that I believe you wrote, and, and then I'll, I'll continue to, or I'll, we'll ask you to continue to tell us about the effort. And that's probably all the time we're going to have, about the effort that it took you to write this book. But you say in, in a writing, you said, without further ado, I would like to begin the story of the man as described by Edward James Olmos, a leader who has powerfully impacted the history of America's diverse Latino population. Beginning as an organizer for the American GI Forum Juniors at the age of 15, he has continued a lifelong career of courageously taking on the challenges set forth by those who practice racism and segregation. He has worked diligently to change to 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 change uh, rigid attitudes while claiming new perspectives for Latinos worldwide. In this way, he has demonstrated his intense love for la raza, la raza cosmica, the term used by Mexican philosopher Jose Vasconcelos to indicate a people, mestizos, who share bloodlines with Europeans, Africans, Asians, and Asian indigenous tribes, created, creating an exuberant and exhilarating history, a brilliant light piercing the dark horizon. This is the story of Raul Humberto Isaguirre. You said you wrote that. Yes, I certainly did. Amazing. And I wrote it with all my heart mm. because I meant it with right, all my heart. Right. This has been the most engaging mm. and tremendous 
work I have done. Mm. Even though the others have cost me a lot of, you know, right. wonderful research and interviews everywhere. This one, I wanted to get it absolutely right mm. because it was one of our premier Latino leaders right. and it had to be correct. Yeah. The facts had to be right. Mm. The, the, you know, the senators and everyone I was trying to reach in D.C., I did 40 some odd interviews mm. and many uh, you're talking about very busy people, mm. people who knew him. Uh, Senator McCain, I got one of his quotes uh, and all kinds of people that were in the very high echelons mm. of our culture, uh, Senator Clinton and, and, you know, at the time and so forth that were it was hard for me to get all the facts rounded up of his life because his life was in so many layers. Mm. Mm. I tell you, Amazing. I sweat blood, sweat and tears mm. <laughs> to write this book six, and I don't regret it. Five years or six years? Well, it's six years, six but years. in the book I say five, but it was yeah. six. Let me uh, ask you to continue to tell us of the effort that it took. Uh, but if you don't mind, maybe in 30 seconds, just so, so there was an issue that he was marrying an Anglo-Saxon lady in the family, right? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Tell us just oh, a little bit about that. Oh, yes, there that. was. Mm -hmm. So he was in uh, Washington because he went there after high school to serve for, with the Air Force. And they wanted him to serve in the Medical Corps, although mm -hmm. he wanted to be a pilot. Mm -hmm. They said, well, we don't have an opening right now for, for pilots. We've got all the training filled. Can you go to Maryland and just work with Medical Corps? Because he had, was so good at science. Mm -hmm. He got a Bachelor's of Science uh, for George Washington University. So he was up there in the uh, doing the Medical Corps. And that's where he met Audrey. Mm -hmm. up in because uh, she's from the dc maryland area mm -hmm. and she was in one of the classes doing some biology working on on uh looking through microscopes and so forth so one of his professors because raul was he knew the stuff he mm -hmm. didn't even have to be in class amazing so he was always running away from class and doing all sorts of other things <laughs> <laughs> as as raul normally does he's mm -hmm. a rule breaker mm -hmm. and so the professor said listen if you go and help these three students i have to help them with the mic uh, microscope, mm. I'll go ahead and give you a passing grade because mm. I know that you know the material. Okay. So one of the students was Audrey, Amazing. who became his wife. Amazing. And when the people of <laughs> in the other side of, of uh, the United States heard his mother, who was Eva Linda, you know, Evita, they called her Evita mm -hmm. Linda Morin, mm -hmm. and her mother, who was uh, Mama Licha, they called her Mama Licha, mm -hmm. Elisa, right. you know, which was Elisa Morin, but she was actually Elisa Espinosa de los Monteros. That mm. was his grandmother, mm -hmm. this fireball, this, this <laughs> woman who was, I mean, she could just, uh, with one look, she could sit people down. And, you know, she was this tiny little woman Amazing. with all this energy. And they heard and they said, oh, my God, you know, Raul has lost his mind. He is marrying some gringa mm. and we don't even know who she is. She's way over there. He, what has <laughs> happened? Is he got, que se volvió loco. Mm. Raul, what mm. has happened? happened to him right and so he said as soon as he clarified it and he said mama es católica mm -hmm. she's a catholic right. and they said oh es católica uh -huh. pues bienvenida a la familia oh, wow. <laughs> so this tells me that that is were work catholics strong yeah. catholics yes the Amazing. parents are very strong they're mm -hmm. dedicated to you know very, very active in the cathedral mm -hmm. right there in San Juan. Mm -hmm. That's where uh, Raul was born in right. San Juan. And we'll get to the San Juans and so many other mm -hmm. things, obviously, on, other, on upcoming shows. So uh, if you can come back, uh, Stella, with uh, we have about six more minutes. Uh, the effort. I really want to... Uh, the, the, the effort and the process for writing this book. Well, the process was um, enormous mm -hmm. because you had to synthesize all the facts that you were getting. Mm -hmm. So what I did first was I researched months and months and months. Okay. I recorded him at air. I started recording him at ASU at the Mercado Center. Is that and, the interviews? Yes, interviews. Okay. So I started recording him with the archives, with the equipment from Arizona State University. Mm -hmm because they have his archives as well as Stanford University has archives. Is, is this archiving system that the, the, the Dr. Christine Marin started at? Uh, uh, no, she, it she started it at uh, ASU, the main campus. Got this it. was the Mercado. Oh, but, but either way, it, it belongs to Arizona State University. Mm -hmm. So I recorded him for many interviews. Mm -hmm. I want to say maybe 12 or more interviews mm -hmm. before he left mm -hmm. to become the ambassador 
of the Dominican Republic. I did not know he was going to be appointed. So you did not have all the time in the world. No. Timing was crucial. Crucial. Mm. And, and what happened was it backtracked me because I had to transcribe all his words. And did you these, have helpers? No. No helpers? None. It was just me. So I would listen to his words and... Because of the Parkinson's that he was had already begun in his body, at times I could not understand, just a little bit, with the slurring, you know, and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I would have to listen over and over mm -hmm. again until I got. But I typed up, transcribed every word he ever spoke. Mm. And that's why I say this is such a memorial to him. Mm. Because it's his words, it's his memoirs. Right that were happened to be written by me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but the effort was in no, the research i cannot even tell you there are boxes and boxes mm. in my storage room amazing of research right and then it's not just the research then you have to put the research aside and you have to tell the story from your heart mm. that's the challenge and raul wanted it to be in a story he didn't want this dry you know biography of just facts so I had so to. So there, there comes the inspiration of the, inspiration. the writer you of to, how you want to present yes. that story, pretty yes. much. And you make him come alive, and then all the interviews and chasing people down for their interviews, telling them, "You can do it online. You can do it on the telephone with me. Do you want me to meet you somewhere?" If they were, you know, close by, how you know, I was like at their beck and call. Mm. Montezuma, the filmmakers, Luis Valdez. Uh, Edward James, almost everybody I could get my hands on, you know, to, to give me a quote, give me something about Raul and his family as well. So now, so he had grown up, obviously, in Texas. So so you, did you do a lot of research there physically? Yes. I went there to for a week and a half, just up and down the streets of uh, San Juan. Mm -hmm. And then I followed him all the way to the Santo Domingo mm. in the Dominican Republic. Because he was an ambassador there. Yes, he was so appointed. So you followed him all the way there. Yes. and That's the only the only way you, you were going to meet with him, basically. After he left Phoenix. Amazing. I was without able to continue my mm. interviews. Mm. So thank God I got funding from NCLR and uh, Rasa Development Fund mm -hmm. with Tommy Espinosa. Right. And I got to go to these... Uh, places mm. so the amount of work that went into it was tremendous mm. tremendous and then myself as a the kind of writer i am i polish it and i'm very meticulous mm. about my work mm. very meticulous mm -hmm. i want it to be right, right especially in this case because i'm i'm delivering you know this hand heart in hand community leader wow i can't even tell you i cannot even begin to tell you all the sacrifices so you made. basically felt a responsibility, a responsibility to the nation literally to the nation literally Stella. to the nation wow and had it not been that i felt that responsibility and also that common pride mm, mm. that we have in right. someone like of course, him of course and I, I when i was like at one time with my face in my hands, with all my research all around me, my you know, I still had my kids. I had everything in front of me. You still and, had kids at, uh, at yes, a school I had, age? I had some at home with me, you know, because some of them never leave. And, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, they never leave. They want to be there right. no matter what. So, and tremendous other commitments. But I recall one time just feeling so desolate mm. because I went through so many ups and downs that it had not been for my, my faith and so forth. I would have never come to the end of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there, there is something about literally, you, you, I think that's how you said it, that God told you something. You were on the verge of perhaps giving up. Yeah. Can you relate the story? I yes. think that's amazing. Yes. Uh, it was one point where I had gotten all the research ready and I had written the first draft. And you, if, uh, you don't know me, but I am not satisfied mm. until I write it to almost perfection, mm. as mm. perfect as I can right. get it. So I write tons thousands and thousands of, of, of pages of drafts and so forth so one night i just i just couldn't go on anymore mm, mm. and so i was uh, by myself facing all this paper and stuff and i put my face in my hands and i said lord you know lord jesus christ i just can't go on anymore i just i just can't i mm. just I, I don't think i can get to the end of this work right and in my mind like this is what i talk about revelations mm -hmm. it's not a voice it comes from internally inside of you came the words very clearly to my mind, I love this man. And that did it. 
That did it. And we're going to have to leave it there. Mm -hmm. We ran out of mm -hmm. time. We, this was just the beginning. So you literally heard the voice, I love this man. Yeah. And I, that gave you the energy I to continue. That was from God's spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. This is only the beginning. We'll, we'll bring you back. And thank you for listening. This is all the time we have for now. Thank you for joining us today. Author Stella Pope Duarte Raul Isaguirre, seated at the table of power number one. We'll be back next week. Have a great day.